Stanford University. Welcome to EE380. The quarter is charging right along. Soon it'll be Halloween. Yay! Um, everybody has a holiday. Um, we're sophisticated. We don't say the computer says it, so it must be right. Instead, we're mostly annoyed by computers. Um, various things. Um, some of them are of our own creation. However, most of us trust something. Uh, I trust my backup. Even though I've never <laughs> used them. <laughs> what are the odds? Uh, and yes, they're on a disk on the same power strip as the computer that they're supposedly backing up right next to it. And there's no sort of surge protection. And the wiring was made in 1902. So yeah, I'm, I'm one uh, lightning storm away from complete data failure. However, we, we as computer scientists, electrical engineers, Try to build reliable systems using these unreliable components. And we, use, we construct various arguments as to why they're going to be reliable at some level. And we talk about nines and things like that. And we base all of our calculations on models that we get from manufacturers, experience, rules of thumb, and that sort of thing. However, how many of those models have ever actually been tested? Or how have they been tested? Or were they really just sort of convenient to calculate with? Well, our friends at Google have decided to count everything, it appears. And a couple of years ago, they discovered the disk drive models were all wrong. That the disk drive failure models were all wrong. <coughs> oh, boy. Um, now we're discovering the DRAM models are all wrong. I'm sure they know that the power supply models are wrong. Capacitors, inductors. I don't know what's going to be worth using anymore. Not, not, it's all going to be worth using, but all the models are wrong. And today's talk is about how we're going to have to readjust how we think about DRAM. Great. <laughs> thanks a lot for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me to be here, actually. And my way here, I was thinking, when was the last time that I gave a talk here? It was actually eight years ago when I was still a PhD student. So it's nice to be back. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, the work that I'm going to talk about is work that I was doing last year in the summer while visiting Google. It's joint work with two folks at Google. One is Eduardo Pinheiro, who's also here today. Uh, the other one is Wolf Dietrich Weber, who actually got his PhD from here, I think, 10 or 15 years ago. So some of you might remember him. Um, Eduardo brought some goodies that I am not in charge of distributing. I leave those to, I think, the seminar organizers' uh, responsibility <laughs> to bring those um, under the, the masses here. So the talk is about DRAM errors in the wild. But before I'm going to get into DRAM errors, um, I would like to give you some um, broader background on what my research ab is about. So overall, the big picture of my research is um, system reliability. How can we make systems more reliable? And how reliable are current systems? System reliability is important. It's important for different reasons. If you're a company, they're important to you because failures are expensive. If you look at the total cost of ownership, running a system, um, keeping it running, actually a large fraction of the total cost of ownership goes into reliability, into protecting against failures and the actual cost of downtime when something does break. Um, there's other reasons why reliability is important. There's actually a nice uh, user study that was done a couple of years ago. And the first time I heard of that stu study was actually in a paper by some of your colleagues north at Berkeley. What this study found is, so not surprising, the system flakiness is also a major source of user frustration. But they actually uh, quantified that. Among college students in Great Britain, they found that 25% in a survey have seen peers kicking their computers. And 2% actually claim that at some point they've hit the person next to them because they are so frustrated. <laughs> so whatever motivation works for you, clearly system reliability is important. And this is a problem that's not likely to go away anytime soon. If you look at how we are currently scaling systems, individual components are really not getting faster anymore. So what we do instead is we're adding more components. So there are more cores on individual nodes. There are more nodes in the cluster. 
And more components is likely to mean also more failures. So if anything, we would expect in the future that the problem of reliability gets worse, not better. So keeping systems reliable is not a new problem, right? I mean, even 20, 30 years ago when people developed the first computers, probably everybody always wanted their systems to be reliable. And the question is, why have we not made more progress than we have? And I think one of the reasons really is that failures are not very well understood. And there are a lot of people complaining about that, uh, saying that uh, much academic and corporate research is based on anecdotes and back of the envelope calculations. Most papers use simplistic assumptions about component failures. And if you ask yourself why that is, it's not that everybody doing, who's doing research in this area is ignorant. It's really that there's virtually no publicly available data on failures in real production systems. So what else can you do then rely on hypothetic assumptions if you don't have real data? So the goal of my work in the past two or so years was try to get my hands on as much failure data um, from real large-scale production systems. And I was really happy to look at any kind of failure data that I could get my hands on. Uh, the first data set that I got was actually a pretty nice data set from Los Alamos National Labs. It spans almost 10 years of data, cluster node outages in all of Los Alamos' systems. It's more than 20 large-scale uh, high-performance computing clusters. All this data is made publicly available. We created a failure data repository uh, with Usenix. So all that data is available. Uh, I've had the chance to analyze a whole bunch of data on storage failures, and that includes both hard disk drives, uh, failing as a whole, and also other types of failure modes like latent sector errors or corruption in the storage stack. And the most recent work, and that's what this talk is going to be about, is memory, memory errors, errors in DRAM. So before I get to the actual topic, which is memory errors, um, I would like to take one step back and talk a little bit about why it's hard to do this work. Because a lot of people have the impression uh, it's a very easy way to generate papers. You get some data, you plug it into MATLAB, and out comes a paper. So really, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, one of the reasons is that, first of all, it's very hard to get any data and to let you, uh, get people to let you publish about it. Because failure data is really, really sensitive information. So failures are embarrassing, and nobody really likes to admit any of them. Um, often it's not quite clear what the failure even means. In the case of DRAM errors, for example, there are soft errors and hard errors. Uh, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But then really, a lot of the work goes into interpreting the data. So even after you have the data, you spend a lot of time trying to make sense of it, basically. So one example, when I did um, my first study of hard drive failures, I wanted to look at how are hard disk failures correlated? Because that's relevant if you want to know what's the probability that you lose data on the RAID, for example, you want to know correlations. And what I found is, when I looked at the time uh, correlations, that hard drives are much more likely to fail at 11.43 AM than at any other time of the day. And when I went back to the people who actually collected the data, that was a high performance computing center in uh, Pittsburgh that gave me the first data set, what I found out is that one of the administrators who was in charge of, after replacing a hard drive, actually logging when exactly this failure happened and when the drive was replaced, got a little bit behind with his work. And so he caught up by just doing cut and paste for two months. And that's why you really have to be careful. When you, take, when you get data, you can really not just take it, put it into MATLAB, and out comes the paper. You have to be very careful and double check everything. And you will, with any data set that I've looked at, you will always run into unexpected problems that you have to solve. So this talk is about DRAM errors. And the obvious question is, out of all the hardware components, why DRAM in particular? And there are really at least two different reasons. One is um, DRAM is one of the most frequently replaced components. That's a result that I got from collecting data at a number of high performance computing sites. Um, at Google, for example, it's the number one hardware reason for why machines enter repairs. Another reason is that. Um, many people expect DRAM errors to get more frequent in the future. And the reason is that chips get denser, and we simply put more and more DRAM into servers. So 
for both of these reasons, we care about DRAM errors. And before talking about actual errors, one step back, what do we really mean by a DRAM error? For the purpose of this talk, what we mean by DRAM error is any situation where you write a bit into a memory cell. Say you write a one here. When you want to access this later, your one has suddenly become a zero. So any situation like this, we call a DRAM error. So why does it happen? Um, there are really two different error modes that can lead to DRAM errors. The first one are soft errors. Soft errors are basically caused by random events. That can be cosmic rays, alpha particles, random noise. And what's important about them is that they are transient. What that means is once you have detected that this zero there should really be a one, and you fix the problem, the problem is gone. And that is very different from the second type of errors. The second type of errors are hard errors which are permanent. Um, hard errors are due to hardware problems, so this cell there is simply stuck at zero. Even if you detect that the zero should really be a one, and you try to override this one with a zero, next time you read it, it will still be zero. So soft errors are transient, caused by random events. Hard errors are due to permanent hardware problems. Now, Getting back different data from what you have actually written is clearly not a good thing. So what do systems do to protect against them? And that really varies. If you look at the, uh, the computer that's probably sitting on your desktop, it probably does nothing because it does not have any error correcting codes. Most server class memory does use error correcting codes. And those codes really vary in how powerful they are. The first class of those codes is called SegDead. Single error correct, double error de correct, uh, detect, and it does exactly what the name says. So it can uh, correct single errors, it can um, detect multiple errors, double errors, but it cannot correct them. Um, the second class of codes um, called tip kill is more powerful. So tip kill can actually both correct and detect multiple errors. How many exactly depends on the particular implementation. So if you have memory that actually uses error correcting codes, you now have two types of errors. So you can have either correctable errors that you detect and correct, or you can have uncorrectable errors that you can detect but not correct. So what happens in each of these two types of errors? Well, if you have a correctable error, it will be detected, it will be corrected, and the system just moves on as if nothing has happened. On the other hand, if you have an uncorrectable error, the typical consequence is a machine shutdown. And actually, in all environments that I have talked to, most commonly, a single uncorrectable error on a DIM is considered serious enough that the whole DIM is being replaced. So it leads to a machi machine eventually entering repairs and a DIM being swapped. Yeah. So what do we know about DRAM errors? <coughs> um, the fact that DRAM does have errors is not a new thing. Um, there are studies about it. There are quite a few studies about it, um, some as old as 20 years. So if you look at those, really almost all of these studies are based on one particular principle, and that is they do laboratory testing. So they take a DIM, they do stress testing, and they measure how many errors you do, you see. And the most commonly used tool is the one that's in the picture up here. This thing that looks like a cross between a gun and a hairdryer is actually a heat gun. And heat guns can produce temperatures between 500 and close to 1,000 Fahrenheit. So that's what you use. If you point this at a machine, you will see the errors going up dramatically. Now the question is, 500 to 1,000 Fahrenheit is a pretty high temperature. And even a hot data center hopefully doesn't get anywhere near that hot. So how realistic are those numbers, error rates that you get under accelerated stress testing with heat, how realistic are those really? And how representative are those of numbers that you would actually see in a production system, a live system in the field? So if you're interested in, tho interested in those kind of studies, there are much fewer studies. I'm aware of only two field studies that really look at DRAM errors in the field in production systems. And those are both very small. So they're limited to a few hundred machines, a few months, and each of these two studies observes about a dozen errors. So a dozen errors 
is uh, nonetheless really hard to say anything statistically significant about them. So in addition to these problems, one thing that's really worrisome, if you look at all the, resist the existing work, is that there's very, very little consensus about the results. So if you just look at the simple question, like how often do those errors happen? Uh, that's typically measured in fit. Fit means failures per megabit in billion hours. If you look at the fit rates that have been reported in all these previous studies, they range from less than one to 5,000. So the huge range, and it's totally not clear what do real systems in the field with modern DRAM really see. Another thing is that almost all existing work is entirely focused on soft errors. That means errors that are caused by cosmic rays, alpha particles that just um, temporarily flip a bit, rather than hard errors where there's a, a permanent hardware problem. So really what we would like to see is um, how do errors behave in the field, both soft errors and hard errors, how common are they? Um, in addition, there are a bunch of other questions that I ideally would like to know. Um, that's, for example, how does temperature affect error rates? How does utilization affect error rates? How does age, the type of technology, the manufacturer, capacity size, uh, capacity chip size, how do all these, effect, all these factors impact um, the error rates that you see in the field? And that's exactly the questions that we set out to answer when we started working on this last year in the summer. And what we use is a really, really nice data set. And as it was said in the introduction, um, Google is very special in the sense that they really, really do a lot of measurements on their live systems, a lot more than any of the companies that I've worked with in the past. So here's the data that we used. So first of all, this data covers, covers um, the entire fleet, Google's entire fleet. Uh, the collection period is more than two years. That means millions of dim days. The different hardware platforms, six different hardware platforms. The dims come from five different manufacturers. All common dim technologies are represented, DDR1, DDR2, FB dims, uh, different capacities, dims of different capacities. Uh, both types of error cracking code, simple segdat and the more complex chip kill uh, is included. Um, the way we get those numbers is we get numbers that are reported by the chipset and the chipset reports both correctable and uncorrectable errors separately. So we have numbers for both correctable errors and uncorrectable errors. Another point, and that's a bit more subtle, is that these counts do include both hard errors and soft errors, but we cannot distinguish between the two. So we just know how many errors were there in total. We don't know what the root cause was. We don't know whether it's a hard or soft error. But both kind of errors are counted in our account. OK. So here's an interesting problem, at least for an academic. It's a problem that usually you don't encounter. Usually, as an academic, you have the problem that you never have enough data. It's really hard to get your hands on real data. You never have enough data. If you spend some time at Google, you actually have the opposite problem. You have a lot more data than you can ever handle. So this picture here shows you roughly what the measurement infrastructure looks like uh, and how the data is actually collected. So each of the individual compute nodes, that's those green things um, up there, <coughs> collects data about all of the hardware components, including memory errors, but also including a lot of other quantities like uh, temperature, CPU utilization, information about the disk and the status of other hardware components. <coughs> and they collect this, this data and keep it. This data is um, periodically um, pulled from the individual nodes by a collector process. And all the data is eventually stored in a big table. And this big table is big. It's really on the order of terabytes, because this data covers the entire fleet, and this data collection has been going on for several years. So there's really terabytes of data. So it's nothing that you can just download on your desktop and analyze. So what we did instead is we used a programming language that's called Sawzell. And it's essentially a, a wrapper language for MapReduce, a more convenient way to write MapReduce programs. So we use that, and that allows us to actually do analysis in parallel on hundreds of machines. And that how, that's how it actually becomes feasible to do analysis of terabytes of data pretty quickly. And in the end, we just use standard analysis tools like MATLAB, uh, shell scripts, ORC, and so on. So getting to the actual results. <coughs> 
And starting with the first question that we wanted to answer, uh, that's the most obvious question, how common are those errors? And as I said before, if you look at the li literature, it's really not even clear what you would expect. The numbers that are reported are between 1 and 5,000 fit, failures uh, in time per billion hours per device. Uh, if you translate that to something that's maybe more meaningful than a billion hours, so you translate that to one year for a one uh, gigabyte DIMM, that corresponds to about 0 0.07 to 350 errors. So it's a huge range. And what we really wanted to know is how common are errors in the field. So what we started is we looked at uh, correctable error counts. We looked at how many correctable errors do we see per year per DIMM. And that's what question? I thought you said you couldn't distinguish between the correctable and the incorrectable. We can distinguish between correctable and uncorrectable, but we cannot distinguish between hard and soft errors. Yeah. So these are correctable errors, and these correctable errors might be due to hard errors or due to soft errors. It includes, includes everything. So it's, this is broken down by the different hardware platforms. What you see is that those counts are actually relatively stable across the different platforms. Uh, the average is around 3,700 correctable errors per DIM per year. If you look at this at the per machine level, what you find is that about a third of all the machines in the fleet, on average, see at least one correctable error per year. So that's quite significant. A third of all the machines per year see one of those correctable errors. So what's also interesting is if you convert that to the numbers that people have previously reported. Question? Is it, uh, all the hard errors incorrectable? As you said, all the hard errors were incorrectable. Yes and no. So in theory, you know, there could be uh, multiple soft errors. Multiple errors, if you say you do, use SegDet, so you can correct only a single error, and you might have two soft errors, um, you have an uncorrectable error. The question is, is that very likely? Probably it's more likely if you have an uncorrectable error, just probabilistically, that uh, a hard error is involved, right? Because if you have a hard error, it stays around, um, this bit just stays bad, and if you have on top of this one hard error, another soft error, or just another hard error, you cannot correct the error anymore. Um, so the interesting question is, how does this compare to the numbers that have been previously reported? And that is the uh, range of numbers that have been previously reported. So really the numbers that we see are a lot higher, and not just by a factor of two. They are higher by a factor of eight to 10. And one of the, the questions is obviously, why is that the case? And while we cannot say for sure what the difference is, what our hypothesis is, and we have actually been working this summer on verifying this, one hypothesis is that the reason is that we are counting soft errors and hard errors. All previous work really focused on soft errors only. So one reason for the discrepancy between our work and previous work might be that we do include hard errors, and hard errors might be a significant amount of um, errors. So this is all correctable errors only. The obvious question is, how about uncorrectable errors? Uncorrectable errors are the most serious ones because they reside in the machine shutdown, and they reside in a DIM being replaced. And that is the um, percentage <coughs> of DIMs per year that see a hard error for the different hardware platforms. Obviously, not surprisingly, this rate is a lot lower, so we have about a quarter of all DIMs, a quarter of a percent of all DIMs in a given year seeing a hard error. If you look at a per machine level, what you find is that about one to four percent of machines in the fleet on average see an uncorrectable error per year. So that is actually quite significant, one to four percent. The table in the upper left then truly is not correctable errors per DIM. What is it per? Uh, th this one here? The upper left, yeah. Uh, this is uh, the number of correctable errors per year per DIM. 3,000 a year? 3,000 on average yeah. per year, but it's, and I get in the next slide, these are averages. And the distribution of errors per DIM is very, very variable. It's actually only about 8% of DIMs per year that see a correctable error. But those that see a correctable errors, uh, in some cases, see a lot of them. So there's high variability, and that's what drives up the averages. Mm -hmm. And I'll get there on the next slide. 
So one interesting observation about the uncorrectable errors is that while for correctable errors, really the results are pretty comparable for the different hardware platforms, here there's really a big difference between different hardware platforms. And there might be different explanations. It might be due to different uh, manufacturers. Um, it might be due to different dim technologies. And we looked at all those. But really, none of these explain the difference. What we believe is the real difference for the differences between the platforms in terms of uncorrectable errors is that platforms C and D, the ones who have the spikes, are the ones that just use symbol sec that they don't use any form of chip kill. There's a question back there. Yeah, I have a question about the unit you have on the second graph. Was mm -hmm. that is a percent effective by the... What's this it? is the, the percentage of all DIMMs that are affected in a given year by an uncorrectable error. So it's kind of your probability for an individual DIMM, the probability that you see in a given year an uncorrectable error. And the reason that we don't give rates in terms of the number of uncorrectable errors per DIM is that once you see an uncorrectable error, typically that DIM is being replaced. So you shouldn't really see many more than one uncorrectable errors per DIM because the DIM is gone afterwards. Make sense? More questions? How do you define the hardware platform? Uh, hardware platform is defined by the combination of motherboard and CPU. And we can unfortunately not reveal any information of uh, what the actual um, hardware platforms are. Okay. Can you see how many DIMMs are on a typical board though? Um, I don't think I can say that. You can get an idea though. So if you look at the paper, it, can com it includes numbers for both um, errors per machine and per DIMM. And if you look at those numbers, you can get an idea of how many DIMMs there are. It seems like within a hardware platform, you're saying that they have the same DIMM technology, the same manufacturer. Yes. Within a hardware pl platform, they have the same DIMM technology not necessarily the same manufacturer. And we have broken things down in the paper also by manufacturer. And it's really not the case that one manufacturer is a lot better or worse than another manufacturer. Any more questions here? Yeah. Um, <coughs> you're relying on the machine to collect your data for you. Yes. Uh, how many errors do you think you lose when you get a crash? <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you do get a crash, I mean, that happens in the case of an uncorrectable error, right? So okay, the question is, for you all have all sorts of reasons it can crash. So, when so how reliable is your data collection? So, if the machine crashes for whatever reasons, I cannot really, you ought to be able to say more about it. If it crashes due to, or if it's shut down due to an uncorrectable error, usually um, this error is locked in the BIOS event log, and so it's recorded when the machine comes back up. I don't know how the data collection works in other types of cra cra crashes. There maybe holes, uh, if you get too many correctable errors, the system might not catch up. And there's a, there's a maximum rate that we can collect. So there's a maximum rate that you could exceed if you have a really, really bad hand. Yes, yeah, so basically the chipset is pulled only every, I don't know, periodically. And the chipset can count only up to a certain number. And, and not to defend our friends at DRAM manufacturers, <laughs> but can you feel for how often the errors are actually due to some, something else? Because DRAM is at the end of a long pipe of things that are just that's a very good question. And so what we can distinguish, so uh, we can tell whether the error actually was in DRAM or in one of the caches. What we cannot tell, though, is, for example, if there was a problem that's due to the motherboard. Um, and one way you could figure that out indirectly is you could look at if a DIM is being swapped because it had a lot of uncorrectable errors or a lot of correctable errors. If the DIM is being swapped and the machine continues to have problems afterwards, then maybe it wasn't that DIM that's being bad. Maybe it's another problem like the motherboard. And we haven't done that study for this paper. Um, we have done it this summer, um, but the results are not cleared for publication yet. But look out for it in the next couple of months. And uh, mm -hmm. are you confident that the undetectable, that, that the undetected errors are uh, ignorable? Uh, I mean, you're only counting, you know, three yeah. or four or whatever. We can only, we can obviously only count um, errors that actually are being detected. Yeah. And it's very hard to say anything statistically about how many errors happen that are actually not being detected. I think Eduardo was trying to look at um, corruption at a higher level, file system uh, checksums and corruption that's reported there and trying to correlate back, for example, with um, errors that are being reported um, by by DRAM, it's it's very hard to really put a hard number on that. There are mysterious errors that 
don't get tracked by any of the signals. The, the error is just there. <coughs> Because that was one of the DRAM, the, the, the disk it, things, that the magic codes don't work. Yeah. Oh, gee, thanks, guys. Yes. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's really, it's very hard, especially um, if you look at live machines, it's very hard to track back those errors because you don't have the, the freedom to instrument every single piece of the system. It's a live production system. So you can only um, come up with hypotheses that you can validate with the data that's actually being collected. Any clues as to why? That's a good question, and I don't have a good hypothesis for that. So the platforms are actually sorted by age. So F is a relatively new platform. I don't know whether it's infant, infant problems. I'm not sure whether, Eduardo, whether you have any yeah, more recent uh, insights. A glitch. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the board designer on that one? Yeah. <laughs> actually, it could be a materials problem. Remember that uh, DRAMs are very sensitive to um, uh, ambient radiation and um, materials like solder contain things that uh, generate alpha particles. In fact, we have, if you look at the DREM density uh, charts, you'll find that there's a section where uh, there is a discontinuity because uh, the DRAMs had to be redesigned to be less sensitive to radiation uh, because the uh, uh, packages had radiation material, ra material that was radiating. So, so one thing that, uh, that I guess could be done that we haven't done is you could look at for that particular platform, for example, how often does it happen that um, uh, there are correlations between uh, errors, for example. If there are strong correlations, it's likely not due to radiation. It's likely due to hardware problems that are just permanently there and cause so keep in, in causing problems. Case, I, can, I can tell you the rates okay. have come down. This was the initial bring up we put a dim that was not qualified with that platform. I see. Right. So uh, uh, timing. Yeah. <laughs> I exactly. see. And then we caught that problem and kind of brought this far down. So we should actually uh, redo those numbers with Probably, uh, the time since <laughs> since then. Yeah. Yep. So you can't scrub RAM addresses the same way that you can scrub cache addresses. I'm not sure about the uh, rates at which caches are scrubbed. So for these platforms, most of them use a scrubber, not all of them. Uh, those that have a scrubber, I think typical rates are that the entire amount of uh, RAM in the system is scrubbed every one or two days. Which basically means, at least for those systems that do have scrubbers, if they are hard errors, they should eventually be detected, or any, any error should eventually be detected, either by an application or uh, at, the, at the latest one or two days later when the scrubber gets there. Okay, so that goes back to um, the surprised, puzzled faces when uh, I presented average numbers of 3,700 uh, errors, correctable errors per dim per year. Um, so one thing to take into account is these are averages. So really what you would like to know is what is the distribution? And the distribution really is highly variable. So if you look at the coefficient of variation, it's uh, depending on the platform and DIM type between 7 and 50, which is way higher than just for, for example, a Poisson distribution. And what happens is that if you look at those DIMs that really have a lot of errors, if you look at the 20% of DIMs um, that make up the most errors, they actually make up 96 to 99% of all errors. So there are some DIMs that just keep having a lot of errors, and this brings up the uh, total averages. So in total, it's really 8% of all DIMMs that have errors ever. Um, and those 8% bring up the average across the whole population to 3,700 errors per year per DIM. So you might ask, where does this high variability come from? So it obviously means there's some form of correlation. You know, some DIMs that start having errors keep having more errors, and there are different hypotheses. Uh, it could be environmental factors. Maybe that DIM is just in a system that runs very hot. Uh, or it could be hard errors. If there's a hard error, then uh, every time again that that cell that has a problem is accessed, it counts as a new error. So both are, are possible explanations. So that was all just about frequency and how often errors happen. Really what we also wanted to answer is how do different factors impact the error rates? And probably the most frequently asked question is how does temperature affect error rates? Uh, I don't know whether any of you were at the Sigmetrics conference this year. James Hamilton from Amazon gave a very nice keynote speech there where he said that the total power budget 
a third of the total power budget goes into cooling. So keeping things cool is very expensive. And the reason that people want to keep things cool is that higher temperatures tend to make hardware less reliable. So it would be really nice if you could actually quantify this effect so that you know how cool or hot you can run your data center. So what would you expect here? It is very well known, uh, and you can do that actually in the lab, that temperature does accelerate DRAM errors. So if you hold a heat gun to a dim, you will see error rates go up. But really what you would like to know is in the field for typical temperatures that are not uh, 800 Fahrenheit, um, how does temperature affect error rates? And that's exactly what this graph here is meant to show. So on the x-axis here is temperature. And on the y-axis is the, the error rate, correctable error rates, for four different platforms for which we actually had temperature information available. And what you can see is, without doing much uh, fancy statistical analysis, with increasing temperature, error rates do clearly go up. So there's a very clear correlation between temperature and error rates. What is not clear from this graph alone, though, is whether there's also causality. So we know there's correlation, but this, does this really mean that higher temperature causes higher error rates? Because one thing that could happen, for example, is that maybe higher workload, higher utilization really causes more errors, but higher utilization also causes higher temperature. So one thing that we did is we normalized for uh, the effect of utilization. And the way we did that is we took all our data points and we divided them into two buckets, one for high temperature and one for low temperature, where high temperature means temperature was above median, low temperature means below median temperature. And for each of these two buckets, we plot the error rate as a function of CPU utilization. And the two lines that you see in this graph are for the hot temperature bucket and the low temperature bucket. And what you see is if you normalize for CPU utilization, for a given CPU utilization, these two buckets actually have very similar correctable error rates. So it really seems once you control for utilization, temperature doesn't have such a strong effect anymore at all. So take, taking temperature by itself, temperature by itself doesn't really seem to have an extremely strong effect within the ranges of temperature that are being observed in the, in the data centers, as one might expect. It was an interesting result, actually. And it was similar to the, if some of you remember the DISC study that Google published a few years ago, it was a similar result. The temperature actually had a much uh, weaker effect than was often feared. So that brings us to the next question. What's the effect of utilization? And before looking at the results, um, what would you actually expect there? And I think the answer is that it really depends on whether you have hard errors or soft errors. And that goes back to the question somebody asked before about the scrubber. Imagine you have a hard error and you have very high utilization. That means that one cell that's bad is being accessed a lot more frequently because the utilization is high. And every time it's accessed, it causes um, the error count to go up by one. So if you have hard errors, you would really expect with utilization your error count goes up. For soft errors, really, every error should only be counted once. You have a soft error, at some point it's detected either by the scrubber or by the application. It increases your count by one, but it's really not clear that it should be affected by utilization. So let's see what the field data actually looks like. So what this, this graph shows you is um, error rates on the y-axis, correctable errors, as a function of CPU utilization. And again, what you see is clearly an increasing trend. But as before, you might ask, is this really causality or is this just correlation? Because again, it might just be the effect of temperature that you're seeing here. But if you do the same that, it, that we did before, where you take all your data points and you sort them into two different buckets for high and low CPU utilization. Then you plot things against temperature. You see that even when you control for temperature, these two buckets have very different error rates. So utilization, even if you take it by itself, controlling for the effect of temperature, utilization by itself clearly uh, seems to relate to higher, higher error rates. And you might ask why. Um, I ha our hypothesis is that 
um, there is probably a significant amount of errors that are hard errors. And hard errors uh, will bring up the error count as utilization goes up. And that's a hypothesis that we're actually working on. Um, Why would that be consistent with probabilistic soft errors that 99% that of the time the cell works and 1% of the time it just flakes out on you, which would be reported so as a soft error? So that's true. So really, um, we oversimplify things by saying there are hard errors and soft errors. Really, um, there's a third category, which is hardware is marginal. And a cell is bad sometimes, and sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. And that might, so my, my opinion is that that's actually a pretty common case. Uh, and we would count that as hard error, just because in our definition we said hard error is everything that's related to the hardware, rather to external random events. But it's, but it's going to detect as a software because it's going to, it's going to correct. Uh, it's, let's say the cell is 99% reliable, so if you rewrite, it's happy. So what our counts um, contain is really just um, total counts of errors. We don't know based on the counts whether it's a hard error or a soft error. We just know was it correctable or uncorrectable. Yeah. And um, so these numbers here are just correctable errors. And they could be due to soft errors or due to hard errors. We don't know. But this might be an indication that a lot of them are due to hard errors or due to exactly the case that you said, where hardware is marginal and, you know, and this, it this cell is flaky and, you know, every once in a while it, it corrects. But that counts into this count here because we're counting correctable errors here. You don't log the physical address of the failure. That's a very good uh, question. Uh, I, when we did the study last year, we really wished we had had information about addresses because then we could say, is it one uh, bit, one address that's bad? or not bad. But we didn't have that information last year because it wasn't collected. Uh, it's being collected now, and that's actually part of the follow-up study we're working on. But it's not data that we can talk about yet. <laughs> or one cent out. What's that? Or one cent out. So you get a whole line of like. Exactly. That's another thing. What, what you would like to know is if you have hard errors, is it usually an individual bit that's bad? Is it a whole row that's bad, a whole column, a whole chip? Um, and there was no way, because last year we had only counts, there was no way for us to distinguish those. But that's all valid questions. Um, another question that people are very interested in who run systems is, um, how do error rates change as a function of age? Because <coughs> if you buy hardware, you want to know how long can you expect this hardware to work without problems. And the common model is the bathtub curve that probably all of you have seen at some point. You know, you have high infant mortality at the beginning. Hopefully you have a couple of years of stable life. I think three to five years is what people commonly expect. Towards the end, hardware wears out and you do get more errors or failures. So how does aging look like for FIMS? Uh, that's exactly what this graph here shows you. It shows you correctable errors as a function of the dim age in months. And what you see is that first of all, clearly age does have an effect. Error rates go up with age. But what's really interesting is if you look at the point in time when the error rates start to go up, this happens really pretty early. It happens um, between 10 and 20 months. So already for DIM that's 10 to 20 months old, you see the effects of wear out, which is interesting, actually consistent with uh, DISC studies. For DISC, we observed the same behavior. Already after a year, you saw higher failure rates than initially. What you also see is that there's almost no infant mortality but that might just be because infant mortality is being um, detected during testing before things are being put into production. So maybe the burn-in testing uh, is doing a good job, either the one done by the manufacturer or the, the one being done on site. Uh, you can look at things instead of being broken down by platform, break it down by the manufacturer and an individual dim type, and you see the same results. So Really, there's a significant degree of aging pretty early on. And in practice, once the is in the field, there's very little infant mortality. Uh, you might ask, how does capacity affect things? If a DIM has more bits, probably that means there's more potential for um, bits that have errors. So probably you, affect, uh, you would expect that things go up. Mm -hmm. So can you think the reason why aging is causing this issue? Like in a so again, you would, um, when it comes back to the question of hard versus soft errors, there's not really a reason why soft errors would go up with age. Um, so it's another indicator that probably hard errors are a major, 
much bigger contributor to the total error counts than previously expected. So what happens in that when it comes to the physics, uh, I can actually not tell you what exactly goes wrong. I don't know whether Eduardo has more of an electrical engineering inside there. Have any of the DIMs been sent back to the vendors for failure analysis? And what do they come up with? There are, there are multiple reasons. But, you know, we, we track these things, but it, we haven't broken down for this kind of study. There, there are different reasons. Because certain, certain hard failures will give you, like, single bit, row fail, column fail. So as you kind of, as, as the DIM moves through life and bits fail, rows fail, columns fail, you would expect then, you know, that yeah. that rate is just going to go up as you pick up yeah. more types of failure. Yeah. So, you know, maybe that curve is just an indication of the different failure mechanisms. And that's data that, this data that actually not only the manufacturers have once you send it back, that's tests that actually um, most data centers do. If a machine goes to repairs, you run a memory tester, uh, and so you can see uh, how bad your memory is and whether, and that's actually when you also do get address information rather than just counts. You can try to diagnose whether you're dealing with, uh, with hard errors and whether it's the whole chip being bad or rows or columns. So capacity and how does capacity affect total error rates? Um, what we did to answer this question, how capacity affects error rates, is we took DIM models that exist in two different capacities. And usually the bigger capacity is twice double um, that of the smaller capacity. And we looked at these DIM pairs and we looked at when we move from the smaller capacity DIM to the bigger capacity DIM for the same model, how does the probability of correctable errors change, how does the rate of correctable error ch errors change, and how does the probability of seeing an uncorrectable error change. And the factor increase for each of these quantities when you move from a small DIM to double the size DIM is what's shown on the, the axis, the y-axis here. So if there was no increase, then it would just be a factor of one. If you double capacity and say all your rates double, this here is the 0.42x increase. And what you see, if you look at the different DIM models, is that there does seem to be a trend of the higher capacity leading to higher error rates. It's not as simple, though, as uh, double the capacity means double the error rate. And that's probably because um, there are many different ways in how you can increase capacity. Um, we looked also, we tried to look at what's the effect of chip size, which would maybe be a more precise measure. And we couldn't really get any statistically significant results. So all we can say for now is um, there does seem to be a trend if you, for the same model, increase capacity, that errors go up. How about age of, how long has a given fab been producing a given design? They do learn. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, so when we looked at the different hardware platforms, mm -hmm. the different platforms actually were introduced at different periods in time. Mm -hmm. And there was not really a trend where you know, newer platforms have higher or lower failure rates. No, no for, a given, for a given chip, for a given, oh, for a given, for a given model. Lifetime, no, the first day it comes out versus the last day it's made, I'd expect the error rate to be different. That is true. And it's, uh, we haven't looked at that. But that's an interesting question. So one question that's really interesting is, what about correlations? Because if there are correlations, so if, for example, a DIM that starts having a couple of errors with high probability starts to have more errors and eventually uncorrectable errors, we could use that information and say, instead of waiting until the first uncorrectable error happens and we have to shut down the machine and replace the DIM, maybe we can early on say this DIM with high probability based on the errors we're seeing right now is bad and should be replaced. So for correlations between errors, really, again, what you expect depends a lot on which error mode you look at. For soft errors, there shouldn't really be much correlation because alpha particles, for example, are random events, no reason for why they should be correlated. For hard errors, obviously, there's strong correlation. If you have a bad cell, the cell will continue to produce errors. Or if you have marginal hardware, there's like in the gray area in between, you have a higher probability of errors in the future after you've seen the first one. So what we looked at is, if a given DIM has a correctable error, what's the probability that it will have another correctable error in the same month? Hmm. Or uh, if, a correctable er if a DIM has a correctable error in a given month, what's the probability it will have another correctable error in the uh, follow-up month? And that's what those probabilities here uh, tell you. So what you see is that, say, a DIM has a correctable error in a given month. In more than 80% of the cases, it's followed by another correctable error. 
And if you compare that to the, uh, the probability for, to the overall probability of seeing a correctable error, that's actually an increase of 10 to 90 times, depending on which platform you look at. So there's a very clear correlation. If you have seen a correctable error, you have a, a much increased probability of seeing another correctable error. So strong correlations between correctable errors in the same gym. And that was just looking from one month to the next month. But what you find is if you look at the autocorrelation function, for example, there is really correlation also at much longer time periods. So even at lags of, say, four or five months, there is still um, correlation. And there's also correlation between the number of correctable errors that you see in one month and the number of correctable errors in the next month. So clearly correlations, which again might point towards hard errors. The more interesting question might be, how do correctable and uncorrectable errors correlate? Because if a correctable error is predictive of an uncorrectable error, then you could maybe react right away rather than waiting for this uncorrectable error to happen. So what this graph shows, shows you is if you have a correctable error in a given month, what's the probability that you have an uncorrectable error in the same month? And what you see is if you compare those probabilities to the probability of an uncorrectable error in a random month, they greatly increased by factors of 200, 400, greatly increased. The overall probabilities are still pretty low, though, between half a percent uh, and two percent. So it's maybe not information that's fine-grained enough to use it to early replace DIMMs. Um, what we concluded from this is um, there seems to clearly be correlation, which seems to indicate that there are hard errors. So maybe what you really want to have is address information, so that you can see if an address repeatedly has errors. Clearly, that's a hard error, and that, has, uh, that creates potential for uncorrectable errors in the future. So to conclude, um, DRAM errors are a valid concern in practice. They do happen. About a third of the machines in Google's fleet per year see at least one correctable error. And what's interesting is that really what these errors look like in practice is very different from what people commonly assume. First of all, just the simple frequency is a lot higher than previously reported. Um, we have strong indication that hard errors really are a dominating, uh, dominant error source. We're working on validating that with, with hard data. Um, <coughs> we're very surprised about the relatively small effect of temperature, because temperature is a major concern. It's a big cost factor to cool your data centers. And based on what we are seeing, temperature is not as strong effect, uh, an effect as, as you might expect. Um, unfortunately, DIMMs seem to wear out a lot more uh, early than you are you might want or you might expect. After about a year, they already have higher probabilities of errors. There's no evidence, and that goes back to a question that somebody asked before, although I didn't present a graph on that. There's really no evidence that newer generation DIMMs have worse error behavior, although, although chips get more dense and there are all these uh, factors. It seems that DIMM manufacturers do a pretty good job in uh, counteracting those in their de design. Um, and we've seen really strong correlation between errors. And that uh, concludes the, my talk about DRAM errors. Uh, what's interesting to note is, so this was all focused just on DRAM errors, but a lot of these observations actually hold also for all kinds of other types of errors that I looked at. So for example, for uh, disk errors, latent sector errors, total disk failures, data corruption, uh, all these events, if you compare what you see in the field with what people have previously reported, it almost almost always looks very different. Uh, the rates are higher, uh, the statistical properties look different. So really, for any type of reliability work, what you really want to do is you want to have more field data publicly available. Um, analyze the data and base your work on the results that you get from the field data, rather than those hypothetical assumptions that you might make. And that's all that I have to say. If there are questions, happy to take them. Error. Yeah. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.